This is Queen's Park in Toronto, and we're on our way to visit King Edward VII. Hundreds of Torontonians pass by him every day without giving him a second thought. Just one more statue of a dead white dude in a park that's full of them. But this particular dead white dude traveled 11,000 kilometers to be here, making a narrow escape from a graveyard of colonialism half a world away. This is Canadiana. In 1877, Coronation Park, Delhi, the site of the Imperial Durbar, a huge party where Queen Victoria was proclaimed Empress of India, tightening Britain's grip on the country. It was a lavish affair, even though Queen Victoria herself didn't bother to show up, and the Durbars that followed were even bigger. In 1911, the British monarch finally decided to attend his own party. That year, they went all out. King George V and his queen sat on golden thrones under golden umbrellas. 80,000 Indian troops paraded before them. There were seas of horses, camels, and cannons. And George declared Delhi the new capital of India. But of course, the festivities were a facade. All the glitz and glamour of the Durbars couldn't hide the truth about colonialism. Like in 1919, when the British ordered troops to open fire on a trapped crowd of unarmed protesters for 10 to 15 straight minutes until their ammunition ran out, they killed hundreds of people. Or the Kisa Kwani Bazaar Massacre in 1930, when they drove armored cars through a crowd of protesters and then used machine guns on those who refused to leave the dead and injured behind. Soldiers who wouldn't open fire on civilians were arrested and imprisoned. But in the end, the resilience of the Indian people won out. They declared independence shortly after the Second World War. By then, Delhi was filled with British monuments to kings, queens, and aristocrats, now an ugly reminder of a bloody past. They were uprooted and torn down, carried away to an obscure corner of Coronation Park. Men and women who once ruled half the world were left to rot and rust in what the BBC once called the final graveyard of the British Empire. They included King Eddie here. He used to stand outside the ancient Red Fort in Delhi, but he was rounded up with all the rest. And he would still be an Indian now if it weren't for a guy named Harry Jackman, a rich Canadian entrepreneur, philanthropist, and politician. Jackman had a thing for statues, and for the British, he got a statue of Winston Churchill planted outside Toronto City Hall, just a few blocks over there. And he thought Queen's Park could use a new addition too. So strings were pulled, the statue was cut into four pieces and chipped halfway around the world to land here, right where the real King Edward VII came to open this park almost exactly a hundred years earlier. Despite that connection, Pliny wondered why 1960s Toronto suddenly needed a monument to a long-dead monarch who ruled over a bloody empire. You might be wondering the same thing. But as it turns out, for Harry Jackman, the guy who dragged Edward here all the way from Delhi, it was never about the monarch. He couldn't care less who it was. I was really not after Edward VII, he told the Globe and Mail. I was after a great horse. And he got it. This is Kildare, King Edward VII's favorite horse, who even got a place of honor in his funeral procession. So, if you're ever walking through Queen's Park, past this statue of a dead white dude, there is at least one thing you can enjoy about it. This really is a great horse. King Edward is far from the only statue in Queen's Park that has a uh, complicated history. And I'll tell you more about some of the others in just a moment. But first, I want to thank you so much for watching. If you'd like to see more episodes about incredible stories from Canadian history, all you have to do is click subscribe. And you can follow us on social media too, at This Is Canadiana. We have many more stories to tell, uh, but to tell them, we'll need your help. You can become a champion of Canadiana by becoming a patron on Patreon or by just giving us a one-time donation on PayPal. Every little bit helps us tell more stories like this one. Now, back to those other statues. 
Outside the legislature, in a place of honor, there stands a statue of Sir John A. Macdonald, the first prime minister of Canada. To some, he's a visionary who united the country through confederation and a brand new railroad. But to others, he's the architect of genocidal policies against First Nations people and exclusionary laws passed against Chinese Canadians. He once claimed that Chinese Canadian culture was abhorrent to the Aryan race and to Aryan principles. Then there's George Brown, another father of Confederation and founder of the Globe and Mail. He fought hard against slavery and hard against Irish Catholics. He once compared them to locusts. Then there's James Whitney, Premier of Ontario, who established public ownership of power utilities like hydro and also tried to crush Francophone culture in the province. There's Queen Victoria, too, the queen that Queen's Park is named after. To many Canadians, she's a benign, grandmotherly figure. But to many other people around the world and at home, she's a symbol of the imperialism and colonialism that we've been talking about in this episode. In South Africa, her statue is regularly vandalized, and she was no fan either of what she called the wicked folly of women's rights. You can learn more about these statues and many others in Queen's Park by following the links that we'll post in the description below. I'm Adam Munch, and we'll see you next time on Canadiana.